Hi and welcome to Boston Media Theory. I'm Marcus Breen and this is a show where we talk to people who are doing work in media and communication, maybe culture as well, in and around Boston. Uh, people who live here and people who may be moving through. And tonight I'm, on today I'm pleased and delighted to have Mickey Metz here from Agaric and we'll learn more about what Agaric is in a minute. Uh, so welcome Mickey, thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to see you. And I wanted to start up by asking you about uh, the development of technology, the technology sector that operates outside the, the for-profit zone, if you like, uh, as a community-based set, set of activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps tell us something about the history of that kind of thing as, as you know and understand it from your experience here in Boston. Yes. Well, it starts way before Boston. <laughs> the <laughs> right. history That's of true. cooperativism, um, as we know it and as it's being framed within the movement, it mostly started um, in America. It, Europe is way ahead of us in this, so I won't even speak to that right now. We're embarrassed. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it mostly started in during um, Reconstruction after slavery, where no one, no um, towns wanted to really deal with buying and selling with ex-slaves. Uh, so slaves formed their own network and shared things cooperatively, right. like um, you know, a piece of land or some type of a business that they were starting or just trading, bartering in things. So there's a long history of cooperative areas in the U.S. starting but then most of them, as you can see, if you look through some videos, they were thwarted by um, other com by communities that were in power, mostly white, mostly landowners, and those were the people who were in power, landowners, and it was illegal for other people, other people other than white males to own land back then. So there had to be some way for the economy to um, work for people who were not in, in that area. As for Boston, um, my cooperative Agaric has been around for 13 years. We do web development, but we also do other things, outreach um, with teaching people about cooperatives and educating them about the history. Um, not so deep in the history, but the recent history of how things are moving now in Boston with um, networks that are forming for people to learn about local cooperatives and learn about how to trade in a solidarity economy network. Um, that's the broader mm -hmm. vision of this. Um, solidarity economy is is very important to the underpinnings of what we're doing. We need to share and um, cooperate amongst each other first before we can um, get bigger and have a bigger network of people to share and buy and sell, etc. And communication, of course, is central to the idea of how people will not only learn about cooperating but also then how they will cooperate <laughs> by... <laughs> you will cooperate! By, no. by, well, I didn't mean <laughs> yes. to point, but no, by giving each other messages, you know, not that message, but <laughs> the message of, okay, in order to accomplish and fulfill whatever kind of human uh, needs that you have and other people have, uh, it, it's very important to have effective, uh, non-biased, colorblind, open forms of communication. Yes, it is, and communication in this era is much different than you know when you and I were young and you mm. would knock on someone's door and talk to them. <laughs> yeah, right, uh, that right. rarely happens now, but um, there is a whole layer of communication tools and um, services that you can use to keep connected. So our job as Agaric, um, it, we've chosen to work in the free software area. Okay where we enable people to use free software, and by that I mean the licensing, like GPL licenses of the actual software itself, to be able to modify, share, distribute, based on the four freedoms from Richard Stallman at the Free Software Foundation. So we, um, I wouldn't wanna say we teach about it, so much, but we enlighten people as to the tools that are out there and freely available that we as the public mm. own. 
We mm -hmm. own these tools and we can take part in building them. If we're not developers, we can take part in giving feedback on what this tool needs for me as a non-technical person to be able to mm -hmm. use it. Mm -hmm. Because for years, the corporations have done a really good job at making free software look like it's bad and Is that right? unusable. Yes, What's the unreliable. Difference Unreliable, right. What, 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 what would be the difference, as you understand it, between open software and free software? It's basically a political ethic. Um, when the free software movement started, um, when Richard Stallman started that, um, there was a rift in the community where some developers did not want it to be tied to any political ethics. No, no politics at all, they just wanted it to be about the software. So they termed their movement open source, which means no politics involved, it's just the software works and it does the job and it, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. So if you're into free software, you're into thinking about freedom. You're thinking of the freedom that this affords a community, an individual, and as a group to work on this, working with non-technical people and technical people to build a free software platform or a service or whatever that um, is equitable and d has in mind the community mm. and who this, um, a lot of software developers um, never look at the question, did you ever write software that abuses someone? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. everyone would say, of course not. Why would I do that? But then if you take it down to the level of what is abuse in a mm -hmm. software, right. it could be as little as not having a definition on a form that you would like when you have gender. You have male and female. You know, why isn't there just a blank space for you to put in your gender, whatever you believe sure. it is? And now we've gotten into a huge discourse on should there be 35 things listed there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or 800 things listed there for you to choose mm. from. But um, yeah, pigeonholing people into things like genders or you know any any description, descriptive things that they're going to be putting in this database, mm -hmm. that is you know something that needs to be refined constantly yeah. and it needs to take input from the community that you're serving. You know, some communities may not have a, an issue with putting a gender thing on their form, but some may. Yes. So, yeah. right. uh, and uh, I suppose the, the other more important question for some people is how does a uh, free and open software, let's call it, let's sort of marry the two uh, yes. so that we don't worry they too do. much about, yeah, about <laughs> being pedantic on those terms. <laughs> how, how is it resolved or how are conflicts resolved wh where people are so often committed to saying, well, where's the profit in this? Where's the market? Uh, and from what I hear you saying is it's not about the profit or the market, it's about how it connects with people and their needs. It's so that. How do you resolve some of those kinds of questions? Well, of course, we need to make a, a living to exist. Mm. Um, the difference between a market, so to speak, in proprietary software, which usually involves selling the software and selling a license or that goes along with it that mm. is renewable every year, like yeah. Microsoft Office, right. you have to have a license and a key, et cetera. Um, in the free software world, the business model is totally different and hasn't been fully um, like looked at yet. Um, we mostly make um, profit by modifying a software by supporting a software or by customizing it for a particular um, client. So right. it's, um, it's not like you can go buy this off the shelf, no. but you can download free software from the shelf, the shelf in the sky, <laughs> mm. and then you would hire a programmer or developer to come in and modify it to your needs. Mm. Right, and, and that's where the, there's a transaction. They yes. pay you for your skills in yes. being able to do that, right? Yeah. And and I gather from what you've said earlier that it it can be a, a process that involves a multidisciplinary team. Yes. So it need only not be a, a programmer. Yes, right. exactly. It needs to be looked at by many different people. Like, how will this software affect the users? How will it affect the community? Um, how will it affect the uh, person maintaining it? Like, is mm. this going to be um, sustainable for a person to make a living supporting this software? 
um, yeah. that exist freely. You know, people can get it free. How are you going to make money? We have to think creatively. We have to think out of the box. Um, there's no reason for us to be stuck in the capitalism uh, hierarchical method of we have this thing and we sell it to you. And then you come to us for uh, repairs and we charge you. Uh, um, yes. it's, it's kind of uh, a chicken and an egg scenario because if you have this software already, then how do you maintain it? There's no genius bar or you know support mm, right. network to go to. Well, people are filling that need in now by creating software cooperatives that deal with support and installation or training on certain softwares. So this sounds to me very much like an alternative <coughs> space, a space in which it, it's almost uh, conceivable that you could opt out of commercial, the commercial enterprise or the commercial imperative of software use. Yes, we have, <laughs> oh. pretty much. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> it's kind of going down a list, knocking them off and looking for alternatives, and when they don't exist, looking for developers that could build it mm. and mm. looking for people that want it and can test it and can help be involved in the building even if they're not a developer. So yeah, it's a constant um, seeing what is needed. Um, uh, Garrick published a blog a few weeks or probably a month or two ago now about the software, free software that we use to run our daily operations in a Garrick. Everything from mm -hmm. communication tools to accounting software, mm -hmm. um, nuts and bolts. It's kind of a reference blog. It's not something you would sit down and read and get something from, you know, an, a realization. But you might, you might say, "Wow, all these tools are available, and I've never even heard of ninety percent of them. That's crazy." Mm. Uh, <laughs> it <laughs> so really it's is. A, well, and, and it, it's crazy in a sense in which when we in uh, in the more academic field of media and communication and culture think about this we might talk about communicative justice yes. um, or to uh, imagine some sort of process of <coughs> of uh, media democracy whatever that means um, where where there's a, a, an entirely different orientation to power because the power is is equally flowing from where it might be merely merely housed as opposed to a database that's usually locked up where you need to, <laughs> to get access to a commercial commercial thing. So there's, yes. it seems the metaphor seems to be much more like a, a free flowing um, stream or body of water. Yes, in case. it's a flow. Um, uh, there's not, like I said, a genius bar or a mm. support desk that you go to. There may be in the future, but right now it's more of a fluid thing where um, the, at the beginning, and still sometimes there are developers that tend to be technical saviors where they will parachute into an area, fix a thing, and then leave, which is not, not a good method. It's not sustainable. We need people, technologists that live in our community, and they're there. There are plenty of technologists next door that are now forming these networks to educate people about free software as in freedom for yourself mm -hmm. and re conserving your privacy and your, um, your personality. Um, we're, this is all being stolen from us um, and it has mm -hmm. been for years and put in the Google's database or wherever. Right. And at this time, people are very comfortable with that, it seems. There seems to be people, more people waking up to it now, but uh, there's still a giant portion of uh, the population saying, I don't do anything wrong. It doesn't matter if they have all my meeting notes and info, et cetera. Well, you know, what if Edward Snowden is in there? You know, aren't mm. you gonna protect him? Mm -hmm. And the, more, the bigger the haystack, the harder it is to find these needles. So more people caring about privacy, not just for themselves, but for everyone that is um, doing what, what are now some dangerous things yeah. because there are laws being made to try and stop this advancement of free flowing of information. Um, there's a war on journalists. You know, who would have ever thought that, well, I guess <laughs> we could have thought the thermometer was bulging <laughs> there a bit mm -hmm. um, during things like Vietnam and things mm -hmm. like that, information that was leaking out to people 
um, up to today, we're, we're not even allowed to know what a body count is from the um, civilians that we're oh, killing yeah. in, in these pop-up wars, they right. call them. Yeah, and, and it seems that, that there's a, maybe just to clarify, uh, a question that comes to mind is, so for you as a, as a black woman, is there a sort of different orientation from within the uh, black community? Within within the U.S., you know, it's a sort of an awkward question for me to ask. But the, yeah. term, the terms of, in which the community might be defined, or is it? Is there other things that you can help me with? Well, I would hope so, but no. <laughs> 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 Actually, um, I'm someone who grew up in a very elite white world, and I've never had a black community. Oh, really? So mm. um, a lot of uh, one of the main hurtful things I hear a lot is, "Mickey, you're black. You should know this." And I'm like, well, uh, no, 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 right. I so I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I made the same assumption as well. It's I'm not sure hard to make that assumption, right, right. you know. And we all do, you know. Like, why do we assume that someone who looks like you would be a professor? Yeah, you right, know. It's right. like because that's what we were shown in storybooks when we were young, right. and I was shown in a black community when I was young, but that never existed for me. So it, it was never a barrier for me which can be very hard because um, I, I just gave a keynote about this at MIT and right. at UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. and it made some people cry, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful thing because it meant I reached them. Sure. And it was all based on personal power. Where did you get your personal power, and how are you enabling others to use their personal power or to even accept that they have personal power? There are giant disconnects of neighborhoods and cultures and I would say um, what the news or media terms as the black community, when you're saying that, you're saying the powerless community, the right. underdog right. community, the community that's been abused by white people. The, you know, and I, I really don't have a perspective on that. I wish I did. And I'm doing my best to meet people that have grown up with that experience now to try to translate no, it, but a no. lot of it is like maybe, over maybe, my head, I right, did not live yeah, these experiences. Right. I saw them on TV right. and did feel connected, but not because I was black, mm -hmm. because I was human. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, wow, right. how do they get from human to black and white and stuff? That was always a chore mm. for me when, when I realized what I had come from and that I was not a normal backgrounder. You know, I didn't have the normal background. Sure, I think it's important to make that point and to. <laughs> to make it, uh, to obviously uh, have made a fool of myself in making the point, but also to clarify that when you talk about community, often that's also a euphemism for a community that's referred to as a black community, right? Yes. And yes. that in, in the case of free, free software, when we talk about community, it's actually a, a, a group of people who are working together Yes. in, in a very multicultural, multi disciplinary well not you know, really it's mostly white is it <laughs> yes right. so it's mostly that, white male is it right. yes right. and we're working to change that mm. but the issues I'm finding is people that are new to this in underserved communities do not have not been taught the critical thinking skills to parse this information mm -hmm. and figure out why they need to know this mm. and also have they have been modeled and um, put into this mindset where they need to have certain um, accoutrements to say who they are in life like I drive a this or I wear this and that means I'm part of the thing here <laughs> <laughs> and so that that makes it very difficult people are still trying to be individuals but within this movement but if they don't understand the critical thinking of the movement, it can be very off-putting to people and they drop out and right. go back to, I need a job. Yeah. You know, I need to look for a job. Yes. Instead of, we're building jobs, we're building work mm -hmm. by building mm -hmm. our communities and determining what needs to be in there. <laughs> well, uh, and, and the, the idea of this uh, timeline for building communities brings me to one of the points I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, the nature of what a Garrick represents as far as the crisis of capitalism is concerned, that, that really capitalism can't manage 
the, uh, the changes in demographics. You can't manage the um, incredible disproportionality of uh, wealth in the society, yeah. uh, that it's more than, more than allowed to encourage, uh, the less than 1% having so, earning so much. And in many ways, uh, much of what informs media and critical work in media and communication and cultural studies is, in fact, the idea of thinking about different ways that communication will bring about change. Because once you have the ideas, you yes. then move very quickly into a, a different ideological orientation. Yeah. And so, you know, how, how would, uh, how would uh, a different way of thinking about capitalism operate? How does it operate in, in your, your thinking in, in with a Gary mm. and with, with people that, that you might invite or who might be participants in the community? Well, um, one of the ways I look at it, having grown up in a very wealthy community, I realize there's nothing you can do to stop someone from putting money into something they like. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. buying something they like if they have the money. So how do we make cooperatives likable? Right. That is what I'm working on. How, does, how do you make it hip? How do you make it like the thing I want to be seen doing? Right. And um, with the news media platforms like they are, they don't really give time to cooperatives as there isn't a big corporate splash of advertising to pay for these shows or pay for this news information. So we kind of leave the capitalism model outside the door and work on thinking how can we have a sustainable model that supports everyone, even the weakest member of mm. society. And we that's got to be not just set up and done, like some people have said, oh, well, communism has failed, blah, blah, blah. Well certain forms of communism, socialism, fascism, there it's, it's, there's never a direct, um, uh, like, what is communism? Not, three people don't have the same idea mm -hmm. or the same right. realization yeah. of right. what it is or have lived the same experience of what it is. So these words, I think they get in the way but to me, capitalism represents a hierarchical structure where there is someone telling you what to do or a bunch of people sure. telling you what to do. And traditionally in capitalism, it has been the wealthiest people who put in the most money. Like I have whoops, the shares so I can um, tell you what to do. Yeah. I own 51% of this company. You know, that's just so strange. We want everyone's voice in it mm -hmm. and we want to have discussions. Um, design justice is a great project coming out of MIT um, okay. at the co-design lab. Okay. It's co-design.mit.edu mm -hmm. and they have courses where they're teaching people how to integrate with what their community needs are and how to not drop in and be a technical savior right. but right. how to be bond with the community and really live and find out what their needs are. Well that's that's fascinating to think that w from within the university sector, which is, let's say, uh, MIT at the high end of the technology and innovation sector, there, there is this kind of um, disruption. Yes. Not that I really like that word because it's used <laughs> for the wrong purposes in many <laughs> cases, but there is this disruption of what we might think of expectations, which is that you go to a, an, an elite institution or you just get a higher, a higher education and uh, ergo you're expected to join the rat race. Yes. And that's been a long-standing critique, hasn't it? Yes, I mean, it has. It's been going on for, for yes. generations. Yes. And, and, and yet, I mean, to get back to my earlier point, it seems to me that this idea of developing new communities based on a kind of claim for communicative justice uh, can be a way of sort of also then imagining an in a completely different orientation to social and economic relationships. Yes. Yeah, Ujima did an excellent study where they had a, an assembly and they had the, the names of all the businesses, local businesses, on the wall and a pro and a con thing. Is this business good for our, our community or is it bad? Oh, What's wow. good and bad? So we figured out which are the extractive companies and then we work on how to change them or get rid of them. So you better tell us quickly, we've got uh, only a couple <laughs> of minutes, Ujima. Ujima Boston is um, a group that is making changes on ground, the ground level with inviting community members in to find out what their needs are, 
what they need built, what they need to act upon, and making connections with anchor institutions, one of the most important things Absolutely. they do. Absolutely. So that vendors can uh, be serving uh, bread and donuts at the hospital instead of, you know, a, a chain. Like That's great. That That's D great. D thing. Chain. <laughs> my, my, uh, my older brother runs a. Uh, a similar kind of idea, he, uh, both an art, an art uh, practice, if you like, but for the community. But but now he's uh, organising musicians in hospitals that's in Brisbane, in Australia. So uh, that's so necessary, uh, particularly in a cancer ward. So you know, yes. people come in from getting the arts and music to sick people. Yeah, so that's in Brisbane, a long way from here. Uh, but hello to my brother Peter. <laughs> <laughs> and there's uh, audio files online right yeah. now. <laughs> so Eugenia, Eugenia is based in, in Boston, uh, yes. Somerville, Cambridge. They're based in the Boston. Rest. Their meetings so far have been in Jamaica Plain, mm -hmm. but they do things in the city of Boston and in Cambridge. Um, anyone is welcome to join and start their own little meetings mm -hmm. that are off of it or cool. bring an affinity topic there and see who in Ujima is working on it, maybe pair with some people who have knowledge already mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, help you to put on events or sponsor talks. Or so it's a very dynamic meetings. sort of sense of community then yes. from a, and a Garrick would be connected with Ujima in some yes. ways. That's We're a business alliance member which means we um, help them focus on what anchor institution should we be meeting? And then we get in a group like other cooperatives get to meet with that, like mm. Boston Children's Hospital. We had a great meeting with them about mm. forming vendorships and they need an arts and music program. They do. Yes, they're they funded. Al they, they also need, uh, I'll get on a bit of a hobby horse at mine, they also need to uh, recognize that, that um, they sh they need to treat or take a, take action against the organizations and companies that are causing cancer, as oh, opposed to just there curing you go. cancer. You yes, know? just working uh, on the end line is yeah, not good. Yes, yes. You know. Uh, so th this this brings me to the idea of how Agaric and Ujima and so on become part of a sort of an organic sense yes. of uh, connecting not only with a sort of humanistic uh, instincts that we uh, would would. Perhaps I would prefer what you and I would prefer, yeah. but also to be to be part of uh, you know what it means to to live more fully by by connecting uh, the full yes. range of human experiences. Yes, it is. What what uh, what do you see as the uh, the future for an organisation like like yours? Is it is it um, so growing? Well, is it is it likely to? It's exponential, expand? and it's not just a Garrick growing. We don't need to grow, but the network of cooperatives needs to grow, and it is. Every Wednesday we have a show and tell online, and we share tips and tricks or stories of how our cooperatives work internally. We've recently hooked up with cooperatives from Argentina that found us online, mm -hmm. and there we're sharing ideas of how we share work how we can share work cooperatively with many different cooperatives around the world. And Excellent. that is a good start. It is indeed. It, it brings to mind a cooperative, uh, in fact, it's a cooperative of communists in Italy, and there's long-standing collection of, of communities of communists in, in Italy called uh, Reggio Emilia, and their, their model has been used uh, in lots of different places around the world too. So there's ways of thinking about how these things go from one country to the other, yes. backwards and forwards. That's what we're discussing. We just, I just came from a discussion on that. Great. Well, thank you, Mickey. Mickey You're Metz, uh, and thank you for your time and for your efforts. And uh, we look forward to seeing what happens with Agaric. Uh, and uh, well, let's see what happens with Boston. Yes, <laughs> yeah. how we can change the landscape. Okay, well, that's it for me. From Boston Media Theory and from Marcus Breen, that's me. Uh, until next time, uh, keep in your communities and keep metering in your communities. See you later.